Hello, everybody, and welcome to this event part of the Festival of Social Science. So we're delighted to be collaborating uh, with the Policy Institute at King's and UK and Changing Europe to bring you this event on uh, net zero in an era of polarised politics. Um, one of the things that's been quite remarkable about discussions about climate change in the UK is the extent uh, of political consensus, perhaps going back to Margaret Thatcher, first embracing the cause of climate change when she was in government back in the late 1980s, when the UK's landmark Climate Change Act passed uh, in the late 2000s. It did so with only three MPs voting against. So there has been a rare degree of political consensus uh, in the UK but also one of the things we've seen is that climate change hasn't ranked that high on the public's radar. Uh, environmental issues uh, have sort of relatively over time trended quite low compared to other much more salient issues like the NHS, immigration, concerns about the economy, and obviously over the last, uh, last few years, Brexit. Um, but we've also seen sort of new and emerging divides in our politics. And that's something that uh, colleagues at UK and a Changing Europe have written about quite extensively. So what we want to discuss today is where are we in this political landscape, much more fractured landscape, divides about leave and remain, uh, still lingering, more emphasis on values perhaps than previous affiliations, driving political sentiment. Where does that leave net zero? What does that mean for the UK's attempts to deliver its ambitious climate change goals. This is, of course, all taking place against the backdrop of COP26, now in its second uh, and more substantive week in Glasgow. So to discuss this all, I am joined by a genuinely stellar panel. Uh, first, Professor Sir John Curtis, Professor at Strathclyde University, and leader of what the UK thinks and known to absolutely everybody on this earth who's at all interested in public opinion. Uh, then, uh, Professor Charlotte Burns. Char Charlie is Professor of Politics at Sheffield University. And then, an avowedly not an ad academic, and please note she is going to have to leave us at five to one, so if you have questions for her, please get them in early. Uh, Baroness Jenny Jones uh, from the Green Party, uh, sitting in the House of Lords, make sure the Green voice is heard there. And last but absolutely by no means least, Dr. Alan Wager, researcher at UK in a changing Europe, and who's been doing a lot of work on politics and has some new data from some work we did back in the summer with MPs. So I'm going to start with John just to work out what we know about where the public now is. Prime Minister made a lot uh, this week, uh, over the last week in Glasgow, of the personal journey he had been on from uh, denier come skeptic to very keen embracer of the need for the UK to be a leader on net zero. Has the public been on the same journey, John, as the Prime Minister? How important is action on climate change to them? Um... Yes and no, uh, but the timing of the journey at least is rather different from that of the Prime Minister. Um, there are two or three surveys that have been undertaken on a regular basis during the course of the last decade or so that have asked people I, about really addressing two issues. One is you know, how concerned or worried are you about um, climate change? And then secondly, also on the arguably crucial issue as to, well, to what extent do you think climate change is being occasioned by human activity? So let, let's just go through some of those. Um, actually, the, uh, the, the governmental department base has been surveying attitudes towards this subject now for nearly a decade. Uh, when it started back in 2012, 20% of people said they were very concerned about climate change and 45% said they were concerned. If you take um, their most recent survey done back in the spring of this year, 33% said they were very concerned and 80% said that they were concerned. So 
quite a substantial increase. Other time series, very similar. Ipsos Mori now find that 48% are very concerned. Back in 2011, only 22% were. And a set of surveys coming out of uh, Cardiff University and uh, academics there with particular interest in climate change. Back in 2016, 19%, very or extremely worried. Now it's 45%. Um, and indeed, if you take the um, survey, the multinational survey that was done for UNDP that was released just before COP26, actually the proportion of people in the UK who believe that there is a climate emergency at 81% is actually equally equal top of the numerous countries that was covered by that survey. We share that accolade with Italy. That said, however, it isn't the case that this increase in concern and worry is one that uh, postdates Boris Johnson becoming prime minister, or indeed, uh, is there any evidence that it's increased in the wake of the pandemic? It looks to go, if, if you look at the various time series, that basically the shift happened primarily under, um, uh, uh, between 2017 and 29. It was actually under Theresa May's premiership uh, that the shift began to occur. And one suspects, therefore, that it's been the gradual drip drip um, of uh, stories about climate change, the various scientific reports, et cetera, that perhaps have been rather more influential um, than the relatively late Damascene conversion of Prime Minister, for which we are told uh, Sir Patrick Valence um, is responsible. Um, one other thing that one perhaps wants to say, however, is that although um, there's a pretty wide degree of concern, doesn't necessarily mean that we've all bought into the argument that this is something that is mainly or primarily to do with human activity. Now, we're more likely to do so now than we once were. Again, if we go back to the, the base survey, 51% of us now say it's mainly or entirely human activity. It was uh, only 38%. I think that it's at least partly to do with natural processes, though the scientific evidence suggests that that's pretty much a minority call. So there's still arguably um, more for those who are concerned about climate change to do in persuading people that this is indeed the consequence of human activity. But there is now pretty widespread, uh, widespread concern, at least, um, about the climate change is actually uh, happening. That's uh, it's really, really interesting, that big shift and big shift happening 2017 to 19 rather than more recently. Um, one of the things that we've sort of noted, you know, if we go back to Brexit, other issues, is that we've seen polarisation by various sort of factors, age, educational status. I wondered whether any of that was reflected in the data you have about public attitudes to climate change. Are the young much more concerned than older people? Are the educated much more concerned than the uh, people without um, degrees? The answer to that is to a degree, um, but certainly the division by age is nothing like as strong as you might imagine from the common caricature of environmental protests, which are often portrayed as revolts by younger people and apparently older people or older people are notable by their absence. So I think this is this is one of the issues where the picture that is often used to try to present the story in pictorial media actually exaggerates the age differences. Um, I mean, just again, just to take the base survey as one of many, you know, how can the proportion of people who are very concerned? Well, in the most recent survey, it's 33% of 16 to 24 year olds, and it's 34% of those aged 65 and over. And that's not atypical. There's a bit more of a difference, and perhaps that helps to explain why maybe younger people are somewhat more vocal on this, when it comes to the question of the cause, and there is evidence, again, from the same survey, that younger people are rather more likely to say that this is in, uh, primarily caused by human activity. Older people are somewhat perhaps more sceptical, and younger people are also a little bit more likely to say they're worried about it as opposed to being concerned about it. But it's it's a degree of subtlety. It's not a major age divide, and certainly nothing like the kind of age divide that there, there has been over Brexit, where you know the vast majority of younger people voted Remain and the vast majority of older people voted to leave. 
Equally, there is a division by education. Um, and indeed, um, you know, speaking outside the confines of the UK, mm -hmm. the UNDP survey says that you know, the principal demographic division is indeed between graduates and non-graduates, with graduates being more likely to be concerned, more likely to say that it's the result of uh, human activity. But again, you know, we shouldn't uh, exaggerate this if we take, for example, um, uh, uh, British election study data from 2019. 70% of people with a degree said it was primarily to do with human activity, uh, but even amongst those without any educational qualifications, the proportion was 57%. So polarised is far too strong a word. You know, there, there is a broad concern here, uh, but yes, there are nuances. There's a slight tilting in the direction of it being younger people and graduates are more likely to be concerned, more likely to, to, to express worry. Um, but I think certainly some of the, the, the media uh, simplicities that are often used to characterize these things are not actually uh, uh, as accurate as we might imagine. Interesting. Alan, you've been uh, asking MPs where they are. We know that MPs sometimes adopt slightly more extreme positions than, uh, than their voters do, though possibly not as extreme as their members, but uh, but where do MPs stand on climate change? What are we seeing there? Alan, you're muted. I suppose the um, uh, the first thing to say is that the sort of the, the crossbench sort of front bench consensus on net zero that was sort of arguably sort of forged when David Cameron was opposition leader remains fairly entrenched. So it's quite hard to tell exactly what backbenchers think. Um, and uh, I, I, you had said three MPs voted against the Climate Change Act in 2008, five voted against it at second reading, and they were, you know, Christopher Chope, Anne Widdicombe, Peter Lilly, Philip Davis, and Andrew Tyree. So a particular type of Conservative MP voted against the 2008 Climate Change Act. But when we got to the sort of the, the, the amendments to the Climate Change Act recently, they were introduced by statutory instruments. So we can't say for sure who exact, who sort of exactly is on the sort of sceptical side of things or how big exactly the number of those who are sceptical is but you know uh, as as John says the sort of broad agreement on the principle of, of net of net zero in the country and this is reflective or I mean arguably has perhaps been um, partly created by this consensus among 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 political el elites but um, I mean obviously this 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 consensus is partly contingent and as you say as seen by the by the development of the position of Boris Johnson, who as far back as 2015 was writing articles in the Daily Telegraph that were quoting sort of Piers Corbyn. And he's a sort of symbolic example of the idea that this sort of this consensus, this elite consensus on climate change on net zero shouldn't necessarily be um, be taken for granted. And we've seen this, this soft launch of this net zero scrutiny group. Um, and it has 40 plus or so members from what we know, but there's no official uh, uh, there's an official uh, a number of, uh, or, or list of who is who is a member, but it's been described as the usual suspects plus, uh, including some disgruntled former ministers. So from that we can infer that the group is, uh, I mean, principally, but not sort of exclusively, uh, uh, comprised of Eurosceptics. But I mean, I mean, the self confidence of the group can be seen by the fact that it hasn't called itself the Net Zero uh, Research Group. It's actually not self styled itself on the ERG like all the other sort of conservative ginger groups in parliament have, and it has Steve Baker sort of heading it. And they're trying to frame this as a debate about the cost of net zero. And one way you can sort of measure that is by asking people, if you put yourself on a scale where zero is, uh, 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 economic growth is more important for the country and 10 is protecting the environment for the country, you can start asking people about the, the trade-off between potentially some of the economic costs of net zero, people might not, accept the, those costs, but it, it, it's a way of asking, it's an imperfect way of asking about that, that, sort, of, that sort of tension. Uh, and it's something that the British election study asked. And we asked it uh, of MPs in our survey with uh, Ipsos Mori that, uh, that we uh, undertook in the summer and we're releasing in a week or so. Uh, and Labour MPs and Labour voters would put themselves at, at exactly the same point on this scale, an average of about seven out of 10, where 10 is, I'm really concerned about the environment, zero is really concerned about uh, economic growth, they put themselves at about a seven out of 10. But Tory MPs and Tory voters are, are, are split. Their Tory MPs would put themselves at about three out of 10 on average. So 
more worried about growth on average than they're worried about protecting the environment. Whereas Tory voters would put themselves at something like a five out of 10 on average. So I think what this data sort of points to and tells us is that, you know, much of the discussion about net zero so far, I mean, there was some brilliant work mm. on yesterday by, by Onward, focused on sort of being honest with, with the voters, but obviously there, there will come a time when, when conservative mm. leaders will have to be honest potentially with their backbenchers about the, some of the economic costs that are, un, that are under, underlying net zero here. Right, really interesting, Alan. Thank you very much for that. And that's a preview of some research that, uh, as Alan said, we'll be releasing next week. Jenny, I um, want to come on to you. Where We've seen this sort of consensus. We've seen rising concern among the electric. Where does that sort of leave the space for the Green Party? Do you sort of slightly feel that actually the mainstream parties are jumping on your bandwagon in a system that it's very difficult for you to break through? And obviously you've got Greens in power in Scotland with two ministerial posts. We have the prospect of Greens joining the uh, governing coalition in Germany with the uh, results of those coalition negotiations going on, the uh, SD, SPD. But where do you feel this leaves green politics now? Well, in fact, um, the uh, in Westminster voting intentions, the Green Party has gone up from 7 or 8% to 11%, and they've taken most of those percentage points from the Tories. And so I think that gives you an indication that the minute people are talking about climate change, um, and there's votes around, then um, they, they will go to us because we've been talking about it for 50 years. But I've got to disagree with your original premise that uh, Boris Johnson has some, had a Damascene conversion. He absolutely hasn't. And Alan talked about Boris's um, listening and taking advice from Piers Corbyn, a weatherman, rather than the 99.9% .9 of the world's climatologists who are saying this is anthropomorph anthropomorphic. Um, climate change. And so, no, he hasn't changed. He allowed a budget to go through last week, which didn't mention the climate emergency at all. And in fact, it did things like took domestic uh, flight, uh, reduced taxes on domestic flights, which is one of the most carbon intensive ways to travel that you possibly can. So, no, our prime minister is reading a script. He is not a convert, I'm afraid. Um, bizarrely, in the House of Lords, when I first got in there, um, it, almost exactly eight years ago, I was the only person who talked about climate change. I was the only person who agonized over this problem. But now almost everybody talks about it. And, uh, and, and that is a move because at least people accept that it's something on our, our horizon. I have never minded other parties picking up um, our ideas, our policies, as far as I'm concerned, the more they do it, uh, the better they get at it and the more time I can spend with my grandchildren. So no problem at all. But the, the one of the absolutely massive problems with net zero is that so many um, conservative, well, other political parties, they rely so much on this sort of magical uh, elusive technological uh, salvation that's going to enable us to get to net zero with the least possible pain. There's all sorts of technology that they're talking about, like carbon capture and electric planes and things like this, that have actually got, and first of all, we haven't got carbon capture. Well, apart from coal, um, you know, coal is a good, a good system of carbon capture, but we've sort of mess that up. And um, electric planes can, can only fly less than 500 miles. Electric cars, they are not a solution. They're part of a, a solution, and but only a small part. And so for me, I'm relieved people are talking about climate change, but at the same time, I'm staggered that they can't see that uh, to make it easy for people. This is the only way you're going to get buy-in from people. If it is easy for them and they don't lose a lot of their well-being, we, we have to convince them that going green is actually good for their well-being, good for their health and good for their mental well-being. Um, uh, to convince them, the government has to make it easier. The government's got to bring in measures, very simple measures. For example, you know, investing more in walking and cycling so that people don't have to use their cars. A lot of people are locked into using their cars because they have no choice, because there's no public transport. And so th there's various measures that could be brought in and could be done relatively quickly 
but governments are terrified of, of the economic impact. And so, you know, if they carry on with business as usual. They talk a lot, but they don't act, I'm afraid. They don't deliver. And for me, that's incredibly upsetting. That's a very useful reminder from Jenny that it's much easier to set targets, uh, uh, particularly far off targets, than it does to actually um, take potentially the short term political pain of the measures required to deliver them. Uh, Charlie, I wonder if I could bring you in and I'm going to remind people, please post questions on Slido and please vote for questions you like, uh, because I'm going to be turning to questions uh, of this. Charlie, um, if you're looking at that, we had the government's big net zero strategy published the week before the budget, two weeks before, before the COP. If you were looking at that, what would you say the sort of big and potentially politically difficult measures are in it? And to an extent, Jenny was pointing out this reliance on technology. Is that the government trying to avoid perhaps uh, more difficult choices. It was very quiet on anything very much about behavior change or demand management, you might call it. Is that the government recognizing that although the public might be concerned about climate change, it would much prefer to have a nice technological solution that means we go on living as now than asking the public to confront a bit more difficult, uh, difficult choices and changing things? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some notable gaps in the net zero strategy. So first of all, there's a huge emphasis on the private sector providing the money. So there's, you know, I mean, I think the government wants the private sector to invest over 60 billion, where the government's only prepared to invest sort of 20 odd billion in the next five years. Um, there's um, a huge change in behaviour that's going to be necessary on the part of the public. We all need to be eating less meat, flying less, maybe using less energy. And those are decisions for us as individuals that will be quite difficult. And the government doesn't want to tell people that they're going to have less choice and their freedom is going to be constrained. Um, so, you know, there are there are changes that we will all have to make. Jenny said that the government as well needs to help us make, make, make those changes more palatable. They need to be easier for us. And, and there's been an unwillingness to grasp that nettle. So yeah, a lot of emphasis on, oh, well, there's these new bright, shiny technologies, which will enable us to, sorry, um, <laughs> which will enable us to carry on with business as usual. And we won't have to make these big changes. And, and when you read the net zero strategy, there's lots of numbers and, and, and it's great on ambition and thinking about the big changes that need to be made economically. But it's, it's difficult to see how that translates to the individual. And one way to think about some of these challenges, EVs. So there's supposed to be a move to electric vehicles. And from 2030, no new petrol vehicles will be purchased in the country. Well, I live in a terraced house in a street with on-street parking. I can't see how by 2030, there's going to be the infrastructure in my street for me to be able to charge my car. Similarly, one of the big challenges is around insulating homes. And we've had two schemes now that have failed completely. So how, how, where's the investment going to come from? Who are going to be the people who are trained to come into homes and insulate them? Again, in the house I live in, it was built in between the walls. And if I want to insulate it properly, I need to have that kind of insulation I put inside the wall, which will reduce the square footage and is really expensive. The other big change is going to be moving away from gas boilers towards heat pumps. I have a tiny backyard. Where is the heat pump going to live? Is it going to be noisy? Are we going to have... Uh, some kind of arrangement between government and local government to have community heating schemes. So there's these huge changes we're going to have to make that require government and local government to be working together with industry. And we don't have those detailed plans yet. And actually really short time frames that we've got to move to towards. So yeah, there's, there's some big changes that are going to be needed and an unwillingness, I think, on the part of the government to be honest with the public about how that might restrict some of their freedoms and to try and push them towards sort of embracing some of these changes themselves. So um, yeah, it's a tricky one. All right, I'm going to go delve into a, these measures a bit more. Um, the top rated question, thanks very much for everybody who's up voting questions, is from Martin Broughton, who said, voters say that they want politicians to solve climate issues, John told us that, but do not support the measures that are necessary to do it because they fear the costs. Now what? Um, 
John, I think there was some polling, Alan referred to it, released yesterday by Onward, um, which was suggesting that uh, I think about 50% of people said they weren't prepared to pay higher taxes for net zero. Not sure that it's necessarily net higher taxes that people need to pay as opposed to um, higher costs for their gas boilers or whatever. But um, what did you, what did that strike you? Did that strike you as something that suggested that politicians needed to tread very warily in looking at um, public attitudes and willingness to pay? Or do people generally ever say they want to pay higher taxes for anything except the NHS? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a fairly standard finding in attitudes towards climate change that people are keener on the carrot than the stick. Um, that indeed, that's not something that's particularly confined to attitudes to climate change. Um, so certainly, for example, um, we take a series of measures that um, uh, have been put to people by a variety of polls. So, you know, uh, very, very popular. Subsidised renewable industry, 80% of us are in <laughs> favour of the subsidisation of uh, uh, renewable uh, energy. Even, you know, uh, regulating household appliances that maybe perhaps use too much. Mm. And some of you may remember there are about uh, the vacuum cleaners that can no longer be more than 900 kilowatts. Um, 67 percent of us are willing to back that. But at the other end of the spectrum, taxing gas in order to make it more expensive, only 23 percent in favour. Taxing meat, well, it's uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent who are in favour. So certainly subsidisation, incentives, carrots are much more popular than our upfront costs. And there was also work that came out yesterday or has come out over the recent days, Ipsos Mori did for cast at Cardiff. And first of all, asking people, are you in favour of things? And then very explicitly saying to people, well, what if it were you to cost you in various ways? And then support unsurprisingly uh, goes down. So that's point one. The second point to make, however, is that there are probably ways of making things more palatable. And that certainly the, the wording of measures, even in survey questions, makes a difference. So if we come back to the one that's particularly at the moment been uh, in the headlines, which is the banning of, um, uh, of uh, uh, new boilers in people's homes, gas boilers. So um, when YouGov asked simply, should we ban gas boilers in new homes? So just a straight outright ban from now point zero, only 34% of us were in favour. On the other hand, when JL Partners recently asked, well, should we ban gas boilers from 2035, then 48% were in favour. In other words, if it's on, over a longer time horizon, it becomes somewhat more popular. And then if we go back to the Ipsos Mori Cardiff study, phase out gas boilers. So don't ban them, but phase them out. 62% on in favour. Um, now, you know, one can laugh and say, well, you know, the, the, the public is inconsistent, sure. But it does therefore mean that there are ways, it, it does suggest that there are ways in which these things can be messaged. And so if it's, if it's done over a period of time um, and if it's sold in a way that's rather more acceptable, then you may get more of a greater buy-in. But the third thing I would make, and I think, you know, this is where, uh, it's something that, that, that Jenny touched upon in her uh, remarks, is that I think there is also something of a division between those people who think that climate change is, in a sense, I mean, to character, characterise, is going to require us, to some degree, all of us to wear hair shirts. And those of us who think of it as being a grand new opportunity, or at least something where alternative technologies might make a difference. And one area where one subject matter, which you know, is the subject of internal divisions within the green movement these days, and which you can also see in public opinion, is the question of nuclear power. Um, it's whether or not building more nuclear power stations is indeed one of the ways of dealing with climate change. 
Now, that's something where, again, polls pretty consistently suggest public opinion is evenly divided. But interestingly, public opinion on that issue is structured somewhat differently. So, for example, building nuclear power stations is relatively popular amongst conservative voters, uh, whereas it's relatively unpopular amongst opposition voters. And that's one issue where, for the most part, you know, what I said to you about the carrot being more popular than the stick, well, it's frankly, that's true of both Conservative and Labour voters. But the question of, as it were, nuclear power, and therefore the suggestion that perhaps technology is a way out of mm. this, technologies that may have other mm. uh, potential uh, issues with them, um, that's where you begin to see some difference in the relative rank ordering of different sections uh, of the population as so far as the particular measures are concerned. Jenny, to come back to Martin's question about costs, um, we saw last year the results of this big citizens' assembly that six parliamentary select committees commissioned. Um, what was the sort of big message you took out of the citizens' assembly? Did you think that showed that with a very different process to just polling people to deliberate with them and give them evidence, you got people into a much greater willingness to accept changes and what did you take out as a result of, of that process? I think when you present people with a problem, there is an urge to solve that problem and that's what exactly what happened. And some really good stuff came out of the Citizens Assembly and I, I would like to see more of them and make them actually part of our political fabric. But um, can I just say, uh, the, the big problem is with um, dealing with climate change is that we have to have bigger ideas, but also small ideas. And so we have to worry about whether our kettle is um, energy efficient and that sort of thing. But we also have to understand that we have to leave fossil fuels in the ground. And uh, one way of, uh, of moving the whole tax burden, because of course it's unfair to put the tax burden on the poorest in society. I mean, I personally would be happy to pay more taxes. And I've always said that because you know i'm not scraping around to feed my kids and and heat the house um but we could start uh, we could put a, a carbon tax on the biggest polluters that could happen virtually immediately the hundred biggest polluters the, the you know the 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 um you know, the fossil fuel companies and so on. And also people who, who fly a lot, you know, we don't have to tax free um, uh, the family holiday once a year, but we really should be taxing people who fly frequently and pollute our planet. planet. They should pay for that pleasure. Um, and so moving the tax burden is part of how we solve this. And I think when you get into citizens assemblies, they see that immediately, that society has to be fair if we are going to achieve um, a future for all of us. And um, I, I spoke recently at uh, an anti-racist rally and I explained, uh, and I, I was saying to them that um, we have to put all of our issues together, the anti-racism and the misogyny against women and the fight for the planet. We have to put all of these things together and actually unite behind them and have a, um, a, 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 a co cooperation um, around social and environmental justice. And I think that's the way forward. And the Green Party's always been into that. That's always been our view. Really, I mean, do you see a sort of way forward for ministers to confront this you know, concern, but concern about the costs? And... Um, <laughs> well, yeah, if they're prepared. So, I mean, I think it's two issues here. There's that issue about cross-party consensus. So if all the parties agree, then it's then much easier to grasp the nettle, particularly around mm. the question of tax. So um, and we were talking about divisions in the Conservative Party and the big division that everyone's been aware of for the past couple of weeks is the one between Number 10 and the Treasury, where Rishi Sunak hardly mentioned mm. climate change in his budget mm. because, because actually he and the Treasury are aware that there are going to be costs that will have to be paid here. And one of the key gaps is going to be uh, fossil fuel duty. If we move away from cars that are powered by fossil fuel, mm. then, then that means there's a gap in revenue that the Treasury is going to have to find elsewhere. One obvious place to find it is taxing big carbon polluters. The government, I suspect, would say, they no, we don't want to do that because then they'll go and relocate elsewhere. Um, so th there has to be some hard conversations about how those gaps in revenue are going to be addressed um, and where 
either borrowing is going to take place or where taxes are going to be raised. And, and I guess I can see John nodding vigorously. We're back to then what, you know, are the parties prepared to cooperate on that? And what are the voters prepared to put up with? And that that's really one of the big challenges. And it's difficult to confront that challenge if you've got a clear division between number 10 and the Treasury. And one can't help but wonder, is it an actual division or is it that we've got COP26 going on at the moment? And so the Prime Minister doesn't want to be seen to be backing the Treasury on this issue. I don't, you know, that that maybe is for others to judge. Um, Alan, I've got a question here from Ginny Smith, um, picking up on this behaviour change theme, which is emerging to be a very strong one in the in the question. Um, but asking about sort of differentiation between the political parties, do we see any sort of big emerging differences? You mentioned the very different centres of gravity between Labour members and Conservative members on our MPs poll. But do we see any sort of big differences in the approaches that the political parties are willing to take? Um, well, I, I, I think the mainstream political parties, big ones who don't have green in their title. I think the interesting question is not whether there are any different, big differences exist now, but looking forward to the future and thinking about you know, the next parliament being potentially where the most difficult decisions on the transition to net zero will be, and whether or not there's a real risk of actually the cross-party consensus breaking down if the Conservative Party, for example, are in opposition, and Labour, and alluding to all the things that Charlotte was sort of talking about in terms of who's going to pay, whether or not, whether or not uh, you know, and voters are on the side with Labour on this, whether it's popular to ask businesses, particularly large businesses, to pay, I mean, there's big political opportunities there for the left who uh, arguably are on the side of the public in terms of where the costs will, who, who will sort of, uh, whether the costs of, of the transition mm. to, net, to net zero. But the lack of any organised opposition really yet, and the fact that we have a Conservative Party in government neuters a lot of the potential political problems around, around all this. And actually, mm. you know, at the moment, Boris Johnson is writing checks that, you know, he thinks he may, may have to, May have to cash, but if he doesn't have to cash, if he doesn't have to, if he doesn't have to um, take the hard choices, uh, it, you know, in the middle of the next, uh, in the middle of this decade, to actually get towards uh, the targets for 2030, then, then actually, you know, all the better for it. If it means that the the, the, the Labour Party or a Labour or a Labour-run government is having to make some some much more difficult choices, so he's actually he's getting all the benefit, if you like. Uh, of 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 making big promises that are really popular about net zero, but isn't necessarily having to make any of the hard choices as of yet. Do we have any feel? You mentioned the sort of you know general view from our survey of back ventures. Do we have any feel for how many uh, conservative back ventures are attracted to the net zero scrutiny? I mean, is it the next ERG or the next? COVID recovery group that is going to make life quite difficult for the Prime Minister, or is it just a sort of bit of a fringe activity that you know Steve Baker's and I mean, it's, it's friends it's still, are doing? It's still a niche concern, I suppose, but then within within and within and and only within one political party. But then I suppose if you look back to I don't know uh, 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 the Eurosceptic movement in the early nineties. I mean, John will know this better than me, but I suppose there were some polls. Mm -hmm in the mid uh, uh, 90s and in the early 90s that showed support for leaving the European Union at something like 20 to 25%, something like that. And then you had groups like mm -hmm. Business of Sterling popping up in parliament. They increasingly became organized and, and started to attract people over time, over, we're talking over, you know, two decades. Uh, so, you know, it's impossible to sort of predict the future in, in, in many ways on these things. But what we're seeing is a potential long, uh, uh, um, parliament lo long battle within the Conservative Party potentially, unless unless there is, and and that's something that potentially uh, Boris Johnson is trying to avoid by taking the leadership on it now. Uh, but in the long term, whether or not that sustains itself when, you know, actually when when taxes rise and when prices rise and so on, on as on this transition, then that's that's hard to say. Anyone else? Now, Alan and uh, Jenny, um, I want to throw another question at you. So pick up on what Alan said there. But Kai Steemers is asking whether concern about the environment presents a potential opportunity for pro-European actors in the UK in the medium to long term. And clearly, these are two big, uh, big issues for the Green Party. Do you see a sort of you know pro-European, pro-climate change action? Um, 
emerging as a sort of new electoral coalition? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by, do do you actually mean people wanting to rejoin the EU? Is that what you mean? I don't know quite what Kai means. I won't speak for him, but I think that is probably what he wants, whether there is a sort of coalition or is it basically, do the constituencies so overlap that basically it's not sort of expanding the coalition at all? I I would think, I mean, only based on my personal experience, that the Brexit fight is over for most people. That there are a few um, people who are incredibly upset about it. And I voted for Brexit, but I'm incredibly upset about the way it was mishandled. Um, And, you know, if I could go back, would I vote for Brexit again? I absolutely don't know if we had a different government or whatever, you know. um, But but going, uh, I'm not sure... The whole Brexit thing is quite such a an important component of um, of political life at the moment. Uh, apart from getting angry with the government because they're such twits. Um, um, but on the um, on the issue of um, uh, climate change, I think I think going forward, um, the House of Lords, and I know this is an odd thing to say, the House of Lords is much, much more forward thinking, much more collaborative and much more, um, uh, well, I would argue far sighted than with the government at the moment. And whereas normally you expect the opposition to be within the House of Commons, actually in our parliament, the House of Lords is the opposition because the government has an 80 plus majority in the Commons. And and so they can just waft everything through. And we uh, recently had the experience I don't know if anybody understands if I say sewage, but we recently had um, the Environment Bill, the House of Lords worked on the Environment Bill. It's a huge bill, badly written, contained too much. And the House of Lords worked incredibly hard on it, days and nights. We sat into the night, uh, which I hate, um, to, uh, to amend it. There were well over 200 amendments to it, which showed a depth of, of disappointment from, from peers. And, the government, we passed 14 amendments, which is also unheard of. Normally we pass back six or something like that to the House of Commons. We get into a ping pong situation and we passed 14 amendments back. And the government pretty much threw everything out. And one of the amendments they threw out was about stopping sewage discharges. And um, for some reason, uh, it caught people's attention and there's been huge pressure on the government to accept this particular amendment. And uh, it was fascinating that the public cared about this because um, they understood the impact of this particular pollution. This particular pollution goes into uh, chalk streams, very precious chalk streams, into our rivers, onto our coastlines, and people could see it. They could smell it when they were walking alongside rivers, and it galvanized um, a social media um, frenzy about it. And uh, MPs had a huge amount of pressure from their constituents Uh, from people who understood that this sort of pollution was very bad and we had to stop it. And yet the MPs still threw it out. Um, So we've got huge problems with with, um, a government that doesn't govern for the benefit of people. And so we can't expect it to deal with climate change if it can't even deal with sewage. I'm sorry, that might not have answered the question. (laughs) It might have been my Sorry, it's my rant because it's what I'm doing at the moment. in no, the environment bill is coming back to you again in the Lords. It's coming back today, yes. And I think we're going to have a lot of very angry speeches from peers. You know, we spent all that time on it, I mean, weeks. And the government, they didn't, the MPs didn't even read the amendments. You know, they just, they just threw them out. And now we're going through the policing bill. I don't get me started on the policing bill. <laughs> okay, we won't get started on the policing bill, but John Red did list. want... John did want to come in on the notion that Brexit uh, Brexit was done. John, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Let me let me go first of all to the the, the question. I mean, is there an overlap between uh, the issue of Brexit and attitudes towards climate change? Um, there is to a degree. I mean, it, it, it it's most obvious if you uh, look at the attitudes of those who voted for UKIP in 2015 or for the Brexit party in 2019. Uh, That's a group that is undoubtedly one that's least likely to be in favor of any of the measures in in favor of uh, trying to deal with climate change. But I mean, uh, otherwise, just again, taking a couple of uh, items from a YouGov survey Mm -hmm. earlier this year, um, 
uh, banning petrol cars from 2030, 64% of Remain voters in favour, only 38% of Leave voters. Um, taxing red meat, 43% of Remain voters, 90% of Leave voters. So, you know, there is, uh, I've said earlier that, you know, the relationship of all of this between age and education mm. is not as strong as people imagine, but the relationship is there, and it's particularly more markedly there, in, mm. as it were, in the Brexit divide. I mean, all I will simply say about the issue of Brexit, which we're not really talking about, mm. is that Jenny is correct in saying that Brexit has died as an issue at elite level. It has, however, despite the fact that it's died as an issue at elite level, it has not disappeared at mass level. It is still very heavily structuring people's, uh, uh, which party people are willing uh, to vote for. Um, it uh, still gets much higher levels. Of, far more people think of themselves as Remainers or Leavers than think of themselves as Conservative or, or Labour or whatever. Um, and the country is still absolutely divided 50-50 on uh, the merits of Brexit. Indeed, if anything, there's evidence in the last two or three months that Brexit's become a little bit less popular. So um, the issue is still there, but embering away in, in terms of the general public. Uh, the crucial question is what is the point at which one of the elites decide to pick it up again? Because if they do, then there's certainly plenty of uh, potential fire uh, there still to be found on this issue. But, which I then, well, that then takes one other final point. Mm -hmm. There is, of course, however, potentially a crucial difference between the two things. Brexit is what political scientists call a position issue. You either think that the EU is a good thing or a bad thing for a variety of reasons, but people disagree about the end. I think one of the interesting questions to raise about climate change is whether or not the, the concern is now sufficiently widespread that actually it's not really an issue about which people take positions but rather it's what we call a valence issue. In other words, it's going to be an issue about, well, we all agree that it should be dealt with. It's a question of how we should deal with it. And to that extent, at least, it's much closer to COVID. So we all agree that COVID-19 is a nasty disease we want to get rid of. We then have disagreements about how the pandemic should be managed. And I suspect that the level of concern about climate change is now such is that the argument between the parties and within the public is not so much going to be about should we be doing something about it, but it's going to be about how we should do something about it. And that still potentially mm. uh, creates mm. room for disagreement, um, but it's a, a disagreement about how we uh, get on, uh, how we uh, uh, achieve something, not really arguing about the ends in the first place. No, that's very interesting. And quite a lot of people interpreted the fact that it's a net zero scrutiny group and the Global Warming Foundation seems to have reappeared as net zero watchers, suggesting that they've given up on the line that it's the science that's the problem and moved on to focusing on the measures rather than the underlying no, and, science. And they're, 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 they're clearly, I mean, I mean, nuclear power is the one really obvious one. So, so Leave voters and Conservative voters tend to be keener on nuclear power, more nuclear power stations than opposition voters and then remain voters. So th that's the sharpest example where you can see there's going to be room for argument about how we deal with this. Charlie, I wanted to bring in a question from Andy Jordan. Andy's asked, has Brexit made the UK's delivery of net zero harder or easier? It's a good question. Um, the I suppose one of the issues is that we've come out of the emissions trading scheme and we're also now outside of the European Union, which has set some um, slightly more ambitious targets in the medium term on the run up to net zero. I don't think it necessarily has to have made it harder to achieve net zero depending upon the decisions we make about how we're going to work with the European Union as both are working, you know, working in parallel to try and achieve net zero by 2050. So it really depends on the decisions that are made about attracting investment into that transition, whether or not we link up our emissions trading scheme with the EU emissions trading scheme, which I think would make sense. And I think a lot of businesses think would make sense, but whether or not it will happen is, um, I think, 
certainly in the short to medium term mm. that's unlikely to happen but it may be you know if we get five six seven years down the line it may be at that point that becomes more politically palatable although if we've grown too far apart it might not it might not be any longer um, a sort of a credible proposition so it doesn't have to have made um it harder as long as we're prepared to cooperate with the european union and and where there are areas where it makes sense to cooperate that we do so Again, given the current political context, the stuff that's been going on over um, fishing and the ongoing challenge in around the Northern Ireland Protocol, this probably isn't the moment at which that cooperation is going to take place. But again, I'm hoping that if we get a bit further down the road, that that, that cooperation will be able to happen and, and, and that we can work in collaboration with EU. I suppose it's interesting, I, if I were part of the government, I would say, no, it's great we're outside the European Union, we can now go off and do all these amazing deals with other parts of the world, which will make achieving net zero easier. But again, I want to see the detail on that. Where is investment coming from and, and, and how has Brexit made, made net zero easier to achieve? I suppose one argument would be was that we were able to move to a net zero position before the European Union did, but there was nothing stopping us doing that anyway. So... Um, yeah, it might have made it harder. It doesn't need to have made it harder. There you go. I've fudged it. I quite like to ping it back to Andy and say, what do you think? <laughs> well, Andy can post that, his views in the chat. But I want to come to Jenny because I know Jenny's got to leave us quite soon. But Jenny, uh, you said you voted for Brexit. Was part of that that you thought actually the UK could do better on its own in achieving climate change objectives? Um, when I first joined the Green Party in 1988, we were against being in the European Union and we, and we voted against um, go, going into, into the common market. And I suppose my views didn't move on. And then when the EU started talking about an army and, and all sorts of other stuff, it seemed to me that we were losing sight of the fact that what we should be doing is uh, being more local. And that's one of the things that's very upsetting about what Charlie's saying, because, of course, now the government is looking to do deals with Australia and New Zealand. And of course, these will not be um, carbon neutral. Uh, getting to net zero will be much harder with those those sorts of deals. And so, um, uh, I am embarrassed to admit that I vote, voted for Brexit. But at the same time, I had good green reasons. Um, and I do think that had we had a better government, we would have had a better outcome. We alienated the EU from day one on the things that we were doing that that didn't need to happen um but still uh, the fact that we could do more local things we could actually support our farmers for example and have um you know um there's all sorts of measures that we could take to make sure that our farmers are able to get the food to us um in a much more local way rather than shipping it up and down make sure that you know they're growing the food that we want to have and also of course there's changing conditions there's talk now that the, um, the, the, the little local environment of the Champagne region has now moved north into Kent, which is why we're getting such superb fizzy white wines in Kent. And so these changes are going to happen and our farmers have to change with them and we have to change as well. We have to understand that um, it, it's not only um, changes in the economy, it's actually changes in our weather patterns and in um, you know sea levels and that sort of thing is why I'm totally against nuclear power. Um, quite apart from the fact it's Green Party policy, um, which obviously I stick to, um, it, it uh, they are actually incredibly dangerous when you think about sea level rises, which we are going to have to face because they're on coastlines, so that they get a, a free source of uh, cooling water and so on. And so it, the whole situation is so complex, and the more you polarize politics, the harder it's going to be. There are so many tribal identities and, and tribal identities rely on the concept of believing in things. You know, I belong to this tribe because I believe 10 things, uh, these 10 things and, and so on. And um, we're going to have to move away from that. We are actually going to see that if we're going to succeed in keeping global temperatures below 1.5 degrees centigrade, then we, we all have to work together, you know, right from you know, from the average person to um, any any government. And I'm so sorry I've got to leave. Um, it's fantastic. I'll just, I'll just give you, Jenny, a very quick chance to answer one question, one minute. Do any of you, but I'm just going to ask you, do any of you believe that the UK goal will be achieved? And I'll leave off the if so, why? Do you believe it'll be achieved? Oh. What, which goal is that? I can't even remember the which goal. 
the UK's goal for net zero by, by 2050, or indeed yeah. our um, deep emissions reduction 70 odd percent by 2035. The problem with getting there is that you have to have milestones. You can't do it all um, the day before. And this is something the government hasn't really understood. They don't want the milestones. They don't want the, the sort of um, measurements um, th throughout the next, uh, it's only 10 years, isn't it? Or 15 years, that's awful. Um, they don't want this. Uh, and they think they can do it all in a rush with all this new magic technology. And I'm afraid they're not going to be able to. And so we start now or, or we're never going to get there. Okay, Jenny, we're going to let you go. Thank you so Thank you. much for so much for joining us. Sorry, um, to no, Thank don't you. worry. Others, um, there's a question here from Edward Jardine Goodall. He said the cost of net zero not shared on an equal spatial basis. For example, you know, rural communities depend on cars far more. Whatever. Um, is it sort of possible to sort of see any sort of differentiation in concern? Uh, differentiation acceptance of measures based on that sort of spatial differentiation There's basically you know concerned very different in cities who lots of whom have adopted climate emergencies to rural areas john has anyone started asking any of these sorts of questions in any of the polling you look at yeah i did pick up something actually this morning thanks for a bit of help from maury um so i mean i think point one is that given we've already said that you know, differences even by things like an age and education are there, but they're not enormous. You shouldn't expect there to be very large differences uh, by geography. But certainly one thing I picked out is that, um, again, the, the, rec the, the recent uh, Ipsos Mori study for Cardiff University, um, that does break down people's level of worry by the index of multiple deprivation. So that's an index that basically identifies mm -hmm. places that Boris Johnson would say need leveling up and uh, other places um, which are relatively affluent. And certainly, uh, whereas in the, the most affluent areas, 50% uh, of people said they were extremely or very worried about climate change. Um, in the most deprived, it was 37%. So it's there, it's not dramatic and actually, um, even people in the middle uh, of the quintiles that are being used, 47% of people said they're extremely or, or very worried. So there's just a bit of a falling off in the mm. areas of the highest uh, deprivation. Um, again, you know, given that you know, London is full of a young graduate population, the level of concern there will be somewhat higher than it is uh, elsewhere. Uh, but you know, again, we shouldn't exaggerate. So the, the, the geography is there to a degree, but it, it's uh, it's not dramatic. Um, Charlie, I mean, does this do the sort Alan, of measure? I think Alan wants. Oh, to Alan come wants in, to come in. Alan. Alan. Yeah, yeah, no, just that, uh, reading the onward thing this morning. I think they said the twenty-five of the top thirty constituencies that are most concerned about climate change are are in London, and the map they produced looked a lot like. Mm -hmm the constituency map that we saw after the Brexit referendum on the BBC website with, you know, black country, the east of England and parts of the northeast most um, again, but well, well, least likely to say they were most concerned about climate change. So that's it. So, so but a lot of these drivers are, as John said, to do with education more than anything else. But I mean, you could start to see some sort of spatial elements to this, uh, 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 you know, think about electoral, uh, even think about first past the post in the long term, but, mm. uh, but, but, the, but the, the rural urban divide isn't necessarily the key driver behind these, behind these things. Charlie, on the substance of the measures you need to tackle net zero, the sort of things in the climate change plan, would rural voters be right to be more worried that they'll bear a higher burden of adjustment than urban voters, you know, we talk a bit about public transport, walking and cycling much easier if stuff is within, you know, a 20 minute bike ride than if you live, you know, six miles away from your GP or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen this already with um, rural areas that there's a real challenge around uh, transport, around access to services. So um, people who live in rural areas are dependent much more dependent on their cars and pay a higher uh, percentage of their salary 
or, or living costs towards transport. So clearly, if, if what we want to do is get people out of cars, then we need to think about investing in public transport in a way that makes it affordable for people to use that, but also convenient, right? There's no, I used to live in the west of Wales and I grew up in London, walked to a nearby town, got there and discovered there was no bus service on Sunday, which somebody from London was like, what? What do I do now? You know, and that's a genuine lived reality for lots of people that they have maybe two buses a day that they can catch and if they miss it, they're stuck. So it's almost inevitable under those circumstances that you're going to to be reliant on a car and that petrol prices or energy prices will make a huge difference to your budget so it is again it's one of these nettles that has to be grasped where we need to think about okay how are we going to fund this transition and how are we going to do it in a fair way so you mentioned the climate assembly earlier and there were two really interesting things that came out of their report one is that they think the transition needs to be fair in some way shape or form but it also can't impinge on people's freedom and I think those politically, those are two really challenging things for a government to deal with. How do we do something that's fair without restricting people's freedom when, you know, and, and without apparently putting taxes up either? So there's some really hard choices that have to be made here. And it seems to me a general political unwillingness at the minute to make those choices. I thought Alan's insight about, you know, actually it might suit Boris Johnson to leave this for somebody else to pick up in a few years time was very astute. Although that said, you know, we're supposed to be cutting emissions by 40% by 2030. And that means we really need to be stepping things up now already. Um, Alan, a very quick question for Angelina, um, and then play into a wider question on uh, from Mara Williamson. Um, she just asked, you talked about Conservative and Labour MPs. Did, what about the others? They're sort of, you know, notably SNP, but did we get any data from any of them or nothing well, to really too speak small, about? Too small to say, but I mean, one of the, the party that is country most worried about, uh, about Jenny's party is, is the Liberal Democrats. And the, one of the big long-term structural changes in our politics, I mean, the, the Ipsos poll that, um, that, that Jenny talked about yesterday has been slightly mis, misunderstood. It showed a, a rising <laughs> green support for the Green Party a drop in support for the Conservatives, but underneath that, there was actually a drop in the number of people that were moving from Labour to the Green Party, uh, from the Conservatives to the Green Party, and, all, and that big boost in Green support was coming almost exclusively from Labour and Liberal Democrat uh, uh, voters. So, um, but, 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 the, but it also showed that the smallest gap between the Green Party and the Liberal Democrats since 2015. So the prospect of uh, the Green Party being overtaken by the Liberal Democrats in national polling and what that means for the long-term future of it, future of the party, is something that's gonna occupy the, 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 the sort of dozen or so Liberal Democrat MPs that we, that we have. I mean, obviously the SNP are in government with the Green Party north of the border, so it's a bit more complicated there. But I think that's, uh, I, I'm interested to sort of know what John thinks about the potential for the Green Party in the long, in the sport, the medium to long-term sort of usurp the, the, the Lib Dems uh, in England and Wales. John, do we think that there's potential there? Can I just pick up, I mean, um, if we're talking about the SNP and climate change, um, there is no doubt that the issue represents a fundamental challenge to the SNP. It is as recently as the 2014 independence referendum, when one of the arguments in favour of independence was still it's Scotland's oil, the UK has already whipped too much of it, but at least we'll hang on to what's left and we'll be able to use that in order to finance a more equal Scotland. We are now seeing the SNP gradually transitioning towards accepting that fossil fuels should not be a way of filling independence. Now, of course, it so often it also happens to be the case that Scotland is a relatively windy part of the United <laughs> Kingdom, and it also has a relatively large tidal flow. And indeed, that was something that uh, Alex Salmond was talking uh, mm. about back in 2014 as well. Um, but there is no, I mean, you know, Nicola Sturgeon is still not being absolutely explicit about what should happen to the Canberra oil field off the uh, off Shetland and whether or not it should be exploited or not. Um, um, and um, it, it does, it, it has sent out the issue has undoubtedly added uh, a new dimension and a reorientation mm. of the arguments about the merits of Scotland becoming an independent country. So it has a very, very particular resonance uh, north of the border. 
Truly, I mean, we talk about what's devolved and what's reserved. Um, Maurice's question is asking whether there's sort of hope in the policies of devolved nations. John's um, just told us, you know, about some of the conflicts that this creates in Scotland, though I think both Scotland and Wales um, uh, want more ambitious climate targets. But how much powers do they have to do things differently from the strategy for the, of the UK government? I mean, I think uh, Jenny made the point that we need to be able to take sort of make big policy changes, but also small policy changes. So I think that applies for this as well. There's the scope for the devolves to be able to adopt more ambitious targets, which they've chosen to do in a number of ways and to develop their own kind of pathways to meeting net zero. And if we think about it, the action that needs to be taken, we've been emphasising that we need to take action that joins up across different levels of government. So from national down to local, and that would include the devolves in there as well. So, the, you know, I think actually having the devolves there could be incredibly powerful because the devolves can mobilise um, the different sectors of society mm. at that more um, sort of less, less the national level, but still really important level that can bring local government into the conversation, that can bring different actors into the conversation. So I think they're really critical in this space. And again, this is an area where it'd be really nice to see the devolves working cooperatively with national government in order to implement strategy. I can see that John's <laughs> laughing um, and I probably smirked slightly, as I said, it'd be nice to see them working cooperatively here. But John's point again underscores yeah. the fact that there are these really big challenges that, that um, are there, these big economic decisions about actually, if you want to achieve net zero, then that does mean leaving oil under the sea or in the yeah. ground. And, and that, and that then means you need to find that money from somewhere else. Um, so, yeah. So they should, yeah, it, the devolves could be really critical in this space. And I think they will be. Um, and yeah, and, and would be even more effective if, if everyone could be nice to each other. And uh, that consensus could be delivered not only across parties, but across different tiers of government as well. Uh, so back in two, back in the run up to the 2010 election, it seems like um, years ago, I went to a... Green Alliance session with a bunch of politicians. Um, I think Oliver Letwin, who was then the uh, environment spokesman for the Conservatives, Hilary Benn, who was Secretary of State for the Environment at the time. And basically the message from all of them was, we all know what needs to be done, but we all know it's sort of electoral suicide if we agree to do it. So what we really need is some sort of pact to take all these measures we need to deliver on climate change away from those pesky voters. So this brings me into a question from Martin again, who's asked, it, you know, if there was a cross-party agreement on difficult measures, I'm really interested in that, and you know, think that's feasible, but what are the risks of a sort of Brexit party type rebellion? I suppose we would be looking to Reform UK who are emerging there, a bit of the net zero scrutiny group talking about this being a sort of elite project being inflicted on people without enough debate. Well, I have to say, I do think they have a point about the net zero target being done by statutory instruments, as Alan pointed out earlier. But do we think that, you know, there is, should there be some sort of cross-party agreement? Obviously, some of these are very long-term uh, decisions. Business says it needs stability that goes beyond one electoral cycle. Is there any prospect of that? And would that then provoke some sort of further realignment, if you like, in the way that UKIP provoked... Uh, provoked an unsettling of the relative pro-European consensus among the major political parties. Who wants to come in on that? John? Well, that's a highly speculative... Um, <laughs> I know, but I'm going to ask you a very social science question to end up with John. Um, so go so, speculate a bit. Um, so, um, um, I mean, you in a sense, uh, I mean, the, the, the obvious potential advantage is you might be able to take people with you. The obvious potential disadvantage is that you'll fracture the party system. And there's plenty of evidence of, I mean, you even only have to look at the United Kingdom. And I would argue that one of the conditions that facilitated the rise of UKIP, which in turn facilitated the uh, promise to hold a new referendum, was the Liberal Democrat decision to join into coalition with the Conservatives in 2010, which meant the Liberal Democrats were no longer able to play the role of the party of protest when people got unhappy with the government and you kept picked up some of that role instead so uh, that is uh, the the danger of parties coming together is that somebody else indeed potentially uses uses that space um i can i mean i think it, you know it, it it partly comes back to what i was saying earlier i mean if actually 
the level of public concern about this is now such that most people think that something at least should be done. And then the argument is simply about well, how we should do it. Well, there's still plenty of room for argument there. But in a sense, therefore, um, perhaps uh, such a, um, an attempt, as it were, to take voters despite mm. themselves, perhaps is not as necessary as maybe it was thought to be uh, 20 years ago. Um, because certainly, I mean, a, a lot of the thing, I mean, I think one of the things to bear in mind here, in a sense, um, almost undoubtedly what governments are going to need to do is to try to create an infrastructure uh, within which people make choices that in a sense nudge people in the direction of doing things that um, are less damaging to the climate, but they are ones that, as it were, they find it palatable, palatable to do because the opportunity structure with which they have now been faced has been changed in such a way that that becomes the choice that they want to make. So you know, one obvious thing is that if you spend more money on public transport and improve it, more people may indeed be willing mm. to use it, at least once we're in a, in a post-pandemic uh, 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 environment, um, et cetera. Um, so to that extent, at least, I suspect that perhaps actually we don't necessarily need to hoodwink the voters as opposed to in the end, make it possible for them to make the kinds of choices they want that they will want to do together with also, you know, a wide, you know, I mean, you guess again, take my own particular hobby, which is gardening. You can see there how, uh, as it were, elite a level advice about what you do in the winter has changed. So 10, 15 years ago, it was dig over the ground in order to, you know, break up the soil. And so the frost gets up. Mm. Now it's don't touch it, leave as it is. Grow things on it if you can, even during the winter, because you won't release the carbon. Now, that's a case where, as it were, elite level advice has changed. Mm. To some degree, that percolates through, because frankly, telling people they don't have to engage in a backbreaking task <laughs> um, uh, during the course of the winter is a choice which put towards which it's probably people to nudge people uh, relatively straightforwardly. So that's just one, you know, kind of one. one yeah. A very but narrow example of where it's going you know, with going with the grain of human nature. I think that's called Alan. <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose it, um, if we take it from sort of speculation about the next decade to speculation about uh, you know next month, and think about those sort of two by elections that are happening next month and the potential for Reform UK to talk about a, an elite consensus and frame uh, a net the the, the 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 net zero consensus as. So as sort of an anti-politics uh, uh, thing, I think, I think that sort of demonstrates the, the potential problems for, for Richard Tice, who sort of described net zero, I think he's called, it was called net stupid or something like that, you know, because I think, I think in 2015, I think in both constituencies, the um, UKIP uh, uh, were a very close third, got a sort of about around 20% mm. of the vote just under. But that was, that was when they were able to profit on an elite consensus over an issue, immigration, which had... Uh, you know, significant uh, um, uh, public opposition to, to to freedom of movement. That's just not there at the moment when, for all the reasons we've said over the last hour or so, uh, uh, you know, consumers and taxpayers have not had to directly confront any uh, any big costs yet. So, so the the I think I think I've, I've had a lot of people, you know, people like David mm -hmm. Runcell have made the point that there's the potential for this to become a big political mm -hmm. issue over the next decade. But in the short in the short to medium term, it still looks pretty pretty unlikely they'll have an electoral influence, the sort of anti-politics, anti-net zero sentiment. OK, I want to come to all of you with my final question, which is from Chris B, which is, this is for the Festival of Social Science, so we're celebrating the contributions social science can make to understanding these issues. What role will social science play in achieving net zero? Charlie? Um, well, uh, one of the things that we've repeatedly touched on is a need for behavior change. So I think a major role that social science can play is in helping us understand how to get people to change their behaviors and what kind of policy instruments they're willing to accept, which is something we've touched on in lots of ways. And there are, you know, there are approaches from different um, disciplines in social sciences. So whether or not it's psychology looking at, you know, nudge and how you get people to change their behavior through to economics and people's willingness to pay and doing those experiments about what people are willing to pay um, in order to achieve these policy goals. So there's lots of different ways that I think 
social science can give us information about what will change people's behavior and help governments as well to think about what will help people change their behavior so i think social science can make an enormous contribution um, in a whole host of ways across the disciplines alan goodness <laughs> i suppose that this is a mantra of uk and changing europe is evidence-led policy making it's something that's that, that, that creates better choices for policymakers, and that's something that social science can can provide and you know thinking about some of the issues where we where you sort of talked about it in areas like public engagement and in public understanding of issues the use of sort of innovative uh, uh, um, deliberative methods and things like that is something that's that social science has already contributed to trying to create a, a sort of sustainable movement towards net zero so i think that's that's a sort of a particular area and i think just more broadly you're know, thinking about for example the amount of social science that's been involved in the last two years as we've coped with the pandemic i think I think I think I think policymakers are, are attuned to the importance of social science, and and that's going to be a big part of of, of reaching net zero uh, in the future. And John, final word: What can social science well, contribute? Well, to, to be honest, I think Charlie gave a brilliantly composed answer that said <laughs> virtually everything I would say. The only thing I would add is this: it, uh, and, and this, as it were, is is more of an observation: is that I think one of the ways where in which perhaps the climate change debate has moved on in the last couple of years, is that um, it's no longer an issue about which governments are worrying, but it is in fact now also an issue about which business is also worrying, and uh, that are in part now regarding as something that they need to address, not least because they think it's going to be in their long-term economic interest to do so um, and to that extent at least though the only way in which I'd add to what Charlie said is that both as it were the evidence from social science about where public opinion is at and also the evidence from social science about the ways in which behavior might be changed is perhaps something that's also going to be as useful to business in its attempts to adapt to a net, net zero world as it is also going to be uh, for the state to do so. Brilliant. Uh, we're dead on time. So I'm going to finish by thanking on your behalf our fantastic speakers, Charlie Burns, Alan Wager, Sir John Curtis, and of course, Baroness Jenny Jones, who had to leave us. Thank you all for so many questions. I'm sorry that there were ones I didn't get to, but uh, I hope I picked out the ones that our panellists could shed most light on. Uh, and do watch out for future UK Changing Europe and indeed festivals.